Assalamu alaikum everybody, Juma Mubarak. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, hi na'amaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyaati amalina man yadihi allahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu fala hadhi lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahtahu la sharika lahu wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد all praise is due to allah whom we seek help and forgiveness from we seek refuge with allah from the evil of our own souls and from our own bad deeds whomsoever allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever allah leads astray no uh, leaves astray no one can guide i bear witness that there is no god but allah the one having no partner and i bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his servant and messenger O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves, and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. O humanity, be mindful of your Creator who created you from, uh, sorry, created you from a single soul, and from it created its mate, and through both Allah spread countless men and women. And be mindful of Allah, in whose name you appeal to one another, and honor your ties of kinship. Surely Allah is ever watchful over you. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah and say what is right. Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa halul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Jazakallah uh, khair for being here. Jamal Mubarak. Um, not sure how to kind of really start this, but I was I was just kind of uh, sitting back today um, and the days before, just trying to think what what can we put together in child for the sermon. One thing I'd been thinking about and just you know kind of running laps around my mind was uh, just reflecting on the past year. Um, I had just seen uh, you know just just a few different posts and statuses um, from people that were mentioning you know it's been an entire year or so since uh you know our our, our country our, our way of life has kind of changed a little bit um with 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 covid coming and saying a little bit in very lighthearted sense um that that we've seen a lot of different adjustments to our routines and uh life as we knew it um with covid but uh one thing that has come about with that and one thing that i've been thinking about there in in, in conversation with that as well was uh keeping our faith relevant um, I gave a khutbah earlier, I believe it was at the end of last year, on how the, the sirah is something that it's not a footnote in our tradition, um, and nor should it kind of be treated like one. Uh, similarly, uh, our tradition itself, our faith itself, is, is oftentimes in amongst our work life, amongst all these things, is often something that is a footnote. It's something that's often an afterthought that doesn't maybe find as much relevance as uh, so many other things we may have. And so uh, what, what, would, what would keep our faith relevant? And so uh, our faith tradition, as I mentioned, on a whole, is in the same boat as uh, the sirah in that regard, in the sense that it's not something that is just put in between uh, two uh, two kind of covers and is just put on a bookshelf and that's what it is, or it's just uh, kept to a different ritual. So it's only expressed five times a day. Rather, um, just like the sirah, our, our faith is something that we uh, our active participants in. Uh, we reflect on it. We also dwell on it in the present and we look uh, look for it uh, in the future sense for hope and all the things that may come. So as I mentioned that uh, it's been over a year since the COVID shutdown and disruption of our lives and routines has kind of come about. And during this time, we've probably had a chance to get in touch with uh, various things or uh, different activities or parts of our lives that we more, more normally had not connected with um, and vice versa. 
versa. We probably develop various habits, um, good and bad. Uh, we probably found things that take up our time and kept us busy, but uh, also we probably found things that just will keep us distracted and just help kind of disconnect us from uh, a lot of the negative energy that was just on the outside. So something just to just to keep us away um, and just get, just to get us through uh, the days. And so. When we, when we think about that, we also think that apart from just finding different things and different activities, we also ourselves went through different stages. We probably went through different mental states, different physiological states. You know, we, we probably uh, went through so many different changes um, through these crests and troughs and just up and down, up and down, and probably didn't find a lot of consistency here. Um, and as I was kind of thinking about just what this time has been like, it's been anything but kind of stable or anything but, you know, just even if you do uh, find a routine, um, what, what this time has kind of proven is that uh, more or less you'll probably find another turn that, uh, that comes about um, with how, th how fast things are changing, whether it's, you know, just different uh, vaccines or variants um, of COVID, things like that. So, so many different things are coming about us. Um, and so when I was reflecting and thinking about it, I was just... Uh, thinking like, you know, how did, how did faith get us through it? How did like, just, just for, for myself or for any of any of you here, um, just reflecting, like, how did faith get us through this time? Or did it? Did faith even play a role? Um, and, you know, when, when we when we think about just this time, and we look back as well, last year, um, when Ramadan was, you know, coming about, and that was, you know, the first time we've, uh, we have had probably a more, more, more so kind of isolated Ramadan, thinking about the challenges that have and will arise, um, especially if we aren't as a community able to gather physically, um, you know, these, these challenges that we face, whether just on our own or with our family or whatever has kind of been brought about by the past year, um, these challenges come about and they uh, chip away at our faith, they, they, they chip away at the footing that we've established. Established. Um, and so what I want to ask here is how can we stay connected to faith? Like I said, we have probably in this time, even if we are uh, relatively, you know, st staying in our own circles and whatnot, uh, finding different distractions, finding different things to really just keep us going, finding different ways. Um, and a lot of times these different things probably more or less will uh, take away from time that we might allocate to faith. Um, and so we may, or, or traditionally as we understood it, so we might be binge watching a TV show or whatnot, uh, and Mugger Benisha might fly out the door and we, we don't realize that until way late. Um, and so, you know, these, these like I said, these are, these are challenges that, uh, that are also coupled with just the, the situation that we're in. Um, so how do we stay connected to our faith? But more importantly, how do we keep our faith connected to us? Um, and so we may find ourselves like I said, connecting to other things. Right now you've had just in the past year alone, there's between current events, shows, movies, people, uh, just like virtually people, um, activities, work, so many different things uh, have become maybe sources of uh, disconnection uh, between us and our faith. And they probably lead us to not seeing our faith as relevant or maybe in the virtual space, especially, you know, it's like, what, what is a traditional faith or what is a, what is a, you know, a faith like Islam going to bring me in this time when I'm living in a, a virtual kind of COVID Zoom world. Um, and it may then escalate, like I said, you, you have so many different things, so many different distractions that might come up. Um, you may then escalate it to just probably not even allocating that time. We may not find that time to be like, hey, you know, I've been on like Zoom meetings back to back to back to back to back. Um, Zora and Usser is probably like an afterthought. And now I just want to get home. I just want to decompress. Hey, my new show is on and I like haven't watched TV forever. Let me just watch that. And so we, we oftentimes will uh, keep these in separate in separate dimensions. And so as a result, um, we may not see our faith as connected. And so then things like not praying, things like not uh, doing what our common obligation is to the to the society around us, those may become afterthoughts, um, but they don't have to be. One recurring thing I've come across in my conversations during like chaplaincy office hours or one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, as well as just having lived in this country uh, as a Muslim, um, is how we make a dichotomy or even more of our life and our identity. What I'm talking about is that 
when you think about it, when you think about, um, you know, when I think about my faith, when I think about my work, when I think about school, when I think about maybe friendships or relationships, and when I think about maybe my own personal time, entertainment time, we're often in different spheres. We have our work life, as we like to say. Um, we have like our, our, our gym life. We have our, um, just like our, our mosque time or our faith space or whatever it might be. Um, and then we also have just our work life and, 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 or sorry, we have all these other things and we have just our social life. So we have all these different spaces spaces that we're living in. It's, it's kind of like there's multiple identities and spaces uh, and three or four people all in one vessel, in one body. Um, but we're, we're all in these different spaces and that's how we're kind of being conditioned to be. Um, on social media, we might be one type of person. Off of social media, we might be a completely other type of person. Um, and so, you know, we're living in multiple spaces and are kind of being shepherded in to these spaces because of the fact that how our society is structured. We, we are just giving into the demand of what just makes the wheels turn here. And so, uh, you know, maybe not thinking so much about uh, let me get a common footing behind all this. Let me just kind of go as it needs. And like I said, you know, your work life might have uh, gone some fundamental changes here uh, and your social life might have also gone some under, uh, you know, fundamental changes as well. Uh, but other parts are also kind of affected. And so when certain things go up like that and they're not all under one banner, um, you can expect to have multiple changes in your own reaction in your life, in your relationship to your faith, um, because it's just all in different areas. But what can we, what, what marriage does it have to put these all under one umbrella? When we see these uh, spaces, like I said, your work life, your social life, your um, just uh, so, uh, just like your relationships or um, gym life or whatever it might be, um, when we see these spaces as inherently distinct and different from one another, we already are harboring a disconnect, a sense of disconnect, not just to our faith, but a uh, disconnect to ourselves. But what if I told you that these very same activities that you do, if it's like you're, you're on uh, Zoom a lot or you're, on, uh, work, you're working from home a lot, you're doing all this stuff, um, and the media that we consume, uh, if it's like social media or if it's just uh, a, a smorgasbord of the new TV shows and movies that have been coming out, would, uh, you would be, that you would be able to find Islam or reminders of Islam in them? What if I told you that? So now provided, of course, that the material you, you're taking in is generally appropriate and not uh, com you know, completely illicit or prohibited. Um, but if we think about that in the sense that when we watch something like a movie or a TV show, um, or just you know something new that I was watching the other day, WandaVision. Um, and if you're a big Marvel fan, you probably watched it too. And you see how the show itself deals with topics like grief, loss, and coping. How often do we relate back once we've consumed that, once we are watching that, once we fall in love with the characters, once we relate to the storylines, we do all that stuff. Once we uh, have just become so uh, immersed in this, in this like, you know, this Avengers universe or whatnot, we get become so attached to these folks. Um, how often do we relate back to the time of the Prophet death? When we talk about WandaVision here, we relate to, back to the Prophet death and how his companions may have coped. What alternate realities would they be thinking of when they uh, just experience this tremendous loss? Think about uh, Umar radiallahu anh. What was the first thing he said when he heard that the Prophet ﷺ had passed away? He said, no, you're lying. He was like, the Prophet ﷺ has been raised like, uh, like Musa to his creator. He, he, he was like, he had this reality in his mind that there's no way the Prophet ﷺ could have passed away. There's no way. Um, and what, what does that tell us about our grief? What, what, what's holding us back from connecting those two dots? Is it, is it because we're just like, this is Islam? Islam is what we define it as, as five times a day, as on Jummas, and it's just that. Or is Islam something more just holistic? Is it something that is, is, is a way of life? We oftentimes say that, that Islam's not just uh, a faith that I just show up to. Like we, we probably snarkily say to uh, people who are Christian or whatnot, it's like, oh, you know, you're, you're just on church on Sundays and things like that. But the same is actually probably for most of us is that it's probably just on Fridays. And then the, uh, for, for the times we set aside to pray, it's just those times. But how, how much more is Islam actually a way of life like we like to think it is? When we see another mass shooting in this country, how often do we think about massacres and of innocent lives that occurred in the nascent Muslim community, like at Bir Ma'una, where 70 or 40 or 70 of Sahaba who were sent as missionaries, they were asked to come. They're like, hey, we want to learn about Islam. Uh, the Prophet sent 40 to 7 missionaries upon request, and they were massacred unjustly, all of them. And you know, and just thinking about more importantly, 
how do we think that the Prophet felt upon hearing the news of such a tragedy? What, what do we think when we hear the news of uh, the shootings like we had seen in Boulder or Atlanta? What, 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 what hits us here? Um, and then also, how did he advise his community to deal with such injustices? It was never just uh, a thoughts and prayers type of response. It was always something to help cultivate uh, a sense of justice, a sense of accountability. Um, so when we study something like that, when we draw those connections, our faith stays relevant in the sense. When we see a uh, disease or a plague that takes our neighbors, we're, we're living in the midst of a pandemic, um, which over you know half a million uh, Americans have uh, have passed away, and so many more. Um, we think about how this disease and plague uh, takes our neighbors and our closest family members. Um, what do we see in the plagues that faced the Sahaba of the after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after his passing, and how they dealt with the loss of their closest companions? We think about the example of Umar an and Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn Jarrah an, um, and in terms of their friendship and the fact that Abu Ubaidah was uh, in Sham at the time uh, and he refused to just leave that space even though Umar had said no we, we you know just just come you just just get out of uh, just get out of Sham come to come to Medina um, but Abu Ubaidah ha had to stay with his people and he 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 came down with the plague and he passed away um, just thinking about the loss that uh, that has been experienced rather than just keep it as this is just like you know a story from the past um what is what is relevant to it to us today because there will be some stuff there what meant what uh, mentality do we have then when we look at the stories of pious, pious predecessors or even in our in the quran um uh, in terms of seeing them struggle and then compare to our own oftentimes we make a mistake in the sense that we will diminish our own experience we might be going through a pandemic, we might have just lost our jobs, we might have just lost someone who was uh, very close to us. Um, but we have this mentality that, oh, so and so went through even worse of a loss, I shouldn't be complaining, I shouldn't have that, you know, so so and so lost all these people, I shouldn't be complaining. There, there's that there's that mentality there. And oftentimes that only buries things further. Um, do we diminish our experiences in this? Do we diminish that uh, the, the um, the need to heal? Do we d uh, diminish the potential to heal? Um, do we think that because they might have gone through worse that we shouldn't even be thinking of a comparison? What's beautiful about the Islamic tradition and the sacred texts and scripture and stories and uh, the history is that these can all have a wealth of meaning and benefit both within their individual context that they occurred and that can be extrapolated to our own. Therefore, rather than seeing that, oh, the Prophet or so-and-so went through such a hard time or such a difficult um, scenario or whatnot, I shouldn't ever be complaining because I can't go through it. Rather, put yourself in those shoes. Ask yourself, what, what did it feel like? Ask yourself that, um, what, what is... Uh, you know what? What do I, what can I relate to in this in the sentiment? Rather than simply, uh, as we do, we put these uh, individuals on pedestals, and they have their exon they have their uh, honorifics attached to them, rightfully so. But we do so in a manner that I can't even touch them. But their examples were made for the fact that we would then learn from them. And I mentioned this isn't something new. The Prophet Sallam, the stories of prophets that came before him would be sources of inspiration and reference. The Quran cites uh, these how these stories uh, were uh, ridiculed by the people around the Prophet his family, his tribe, um, like the, the closest, his extended family, the people around him would say that these are tales of the ancient, Asatir al-Awwalin, that these are just fables. You're, you're just making stuff up. When he would cite stories of Moses and the Exodus story and all of the prophets who came before him, they, and, and of Ad and Thamud and the people before, um, he, they would they were ridicule. They'd be like, hey, this is, this is like bogus. Like, what are you talking about? Um, and think about how some folks in our, in our modern times talk about our faith and Islam. And just dismiss it. You know, we we have uh, a unenlightened, enlightened phase where people, you know, may look at faith and be like, you know, this is archaic. Like, obviously, science and technology is the way. That your 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 faith is just very um, hollowed out. It's the, what what relevance does it have uh, in this space? And how does that feel to you when you hear that? And how do you think it felt to the Prophet Sallallahu when he heard that from his closest um, family members and his closest tribesmen who would maybe say that at first? Who would just say that this is just like this is this is this is nonsense? Like, what are you talking about? Um, and these would actually be stories that he would draw inspiration from and just relate ourselves. If the Prophet Sun drew back to those prophets, what about us to the Prophet when we relate any stories and they are shot down like that? 
do we, does, is, that, is that a reason for us to kind of give up? Um, and so just thinking about what, what, do we, what do we share in common with the Prophet ﷺ? What do we share in common with the story of Islam? Rather than putting that distance between us, because then there will be that disconnect already in which we can't relate to it. We won't be able to say that, oh, the Prophet ﷺ lost a child, therefore I can't complain because the Prophet ﷺ didn't, uh, you know, he, he lost so many children. Why, why would I complain? No, the Prophet ﷺ lost a child. If you lost a child as well, you, have, you, you, you may be able to empathize even better with them. He can probably empathize better with you um, on that note, rather than just diminishing the grief you're experiencing, or rather than just, just, just putting it to the side. Um, the Prophet ﷺ would also relate these stories in the, the stories with regards to the, the, the predecessors of the, the prophets preceding him that uh, these stories in conversations and situations with his companions. So there's an example of uh, the... Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam giving out charity. And I believe a Bedouin had um, just said that, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being unjust. Um, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got really upset. Uh, and he made, a, he made a remark of the, 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 to the extent of that uh, Musa Alayhi Salaam was, uh, you know, being hurt by his people. Um, and yet he was still patient. You know, he endured more than this or he endured this and he still stayed patient. Um, and he kept those stories relevant. He kept those stories and these stories were revealed as sources of strength. So when we think about it, not only only did he just say, you know, just like, oh, Musa went through this, it was worse for him. How, where, where can I even like get off to comparing? But rather he brought that conversation. He was like, Moses was even hurt by remarks like this, but he still stayed patient. Like I need to try and at least to try and at least stay that patient. Um, so just thinking how he would bring his faith, he would keep his faith relevant in, in, in seventh uh, century Arabia from what it had been um, in terms of thousands of years before. Um, and so what about us here? The Prophet ﷺ would also keep the entertainment and activities of his time relevant to the people when teaching them about faith. We talked about TV shows. I mentioned like one, one I was watching here, WandaVision, um, and it, it's commentary on uh, grief and coping and whatnot. Um, but thinking about what the Prophet ﷺ had said with regards to uh, poetry. Poetry was the art. Poetry was literally um, your entertainment uh, in, 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 in that scene. So you can think of like movies, you can think of TV, you can think of, uh, you know, just just plays like Hamilton. You can think of all these musical type of deals. Uh, and poetry was the uh, the standard bearer for him. And he, he didn't just come out and dismiss them. He said, there is some wisdom in poetry. There is wisdom in some poetry. And even in his mosque, he had a member set up for the poet. So you, you see that he it's not separate. He would he would bring these things together. He would obviously uh, give them permission where it uh, where there was overlap, and it wouldn't be something that's completely contradictory to each other. So not to say that every single type of media or every single type of content that's out there is just something we can just take in. Um, there there are certain types that do have these crossovers and these benefits. And so how did the Prophet relate to that? The example of the Prophet when he would uh, when he related about wrestling, he uh, this was also a sport within uh, within um, uh, within Arabia at the time, and so the Prophet asked whom to to his to his Sahabi, whom do you consider a wrestler among you? And the people replied, well, you know, obviously the the the, the man or the person whom people can't defeat in wrestling, uh, and they're like, what kind of a question is that? And he said, no, it's the one who controls himself. When, he's in, uh, when he is angry or just consumed by anger. This was the wrestler. But he played on that, uh, that, that, that metaphor and he, he drew to what they were familiar with. They knew what a wrestler was. He wasn't going to draw a parable just out of nowhere. He drew a parable to something they could relate to. And he said, What's, who, who do you think that person is? And they related because that's what, that's what we see. We see wrestling, we enjoy wrestling, and this is what it is. Um, but he said, no, it's actually about anger and someone who can control their anger. So you see how he kept the faith relevant by relating to exactly what the people knew and keeping those in conversation as opposed to something that's in a silo and just something completely alien to what they knew. Otherwise, people probably wouldn't have embraced Islam unless they were able to find relation to it at some point. And so we must be open and challenge ourselves to draw back the uh, connections to our faith. And there are many, like I said, um, if we are wanting to feel relevant, we want to, we want to challenge that notion that, uh, you know, you, there's, there's just an inherent separation of so many of these things um, that you can't connect your faith to these and, and rather challenge that notion and say, no, like, you know, let me see where in my life can I connect my faith to. The Prophet ﷺ was someone who Aisha would describe as 
uh, as someone who would mend his own clothes, he would prepare his own food, he would do things. What does that, what connection does that have to uh, our own lives? What does that connection have to uh, us outside of the public sphere, in the private sphere? So again, that same thing, we have this notion of who are you in the public and who are you in the private? We oftentimes dismiss people's uh, behaviors because, oh, you know, they're, they're this way in private, but hey, in public, they're, they're a great person. So we, we see that dichotomy. Um, and how do we erase that dichotomy, especially as Muslims, when we don't live in these separate spheres. We have those parts of our lives. We have, I have my home where I go to work or go, go, go uh, to stay, but I go to sleep. Um, but I have my work where I also go to work. But why, in, if any case, should I have two different people there at any times? Why should people see two sides of the face? And that tells you of an inherent disconnection that you have within um, that we can then mend uh, if we bring in our faith and say, no, you know, I'm not just the person that is at home. I pray at home and I'm embarrassed to pray outside where people will judge me. Um, to keep that connection alive, keep that connection, because that is just a reflection of the disconnection that's there. And so, you know, the more we isolate ourselves and our faith in times of trial and tribulation, as well as in times of successes and triumph, the greater chance we have of seeing our faith uh, as inapplicable or disconnected or irrelevant from our lived realities, because we might be living in a virtual world, we might be living in a world that is just completely different from what we are reading in between scripture and what we are reading in stories of the prophets. And we're like, yeah, this these guys didn't even have aut automated vehicles. Like, what, what are we talking about? Um, where's the connection um, that, that's there? And so, you know, we, 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 we already are um, in that space where we are uh, just by structure uh, wanting to isolate and disconnect ourselves and just keep things in separate spheres. Yet, if we keep things in conversation with our faith, if it's something as, as applicable as how your work environment changes, how your, uh, what media you consume is there, you keep your tradition um, at the forefront of your conversations, or at least of your thoughts, you reduce that disconnection and the perceptions of it not being relevant within your own fears, as well as maybe that which is projected onto you. So the question I ask, and I leave you with here today, inshallah, as we go into the second part, is that just looking at your life, especially in the past year where so many things have changed, how has your relationship to your faith changed? How has your relationship to seeing your faith changed? Has it, is it something that uh, I, I think about now even more than ever? I'm, I'm by myself here um, and I, I'm just more isolated with my faith or is it something that, uh, you know, I've just been seeing so many things going on, so many things wrong in the world. Islam just does not have the answers I'm looking for. And I'm, I'm watching these TV shows. I'm watching all this stuff. I'm watching, um, uh, I'm taking in all the social media stuff, but I'm not, uh, I, like I can see just Islam does not fit into these into these spaces. And ask yourself, what's the reason there? Why, why are we keeping Islam on the back burner and not at the forefront like the shield that it is? So just thinking about how can we continue to connect our faith to our lived realities, because that is exactly what Islam is. Islam is a lived reality. And we like to say that, like I said, we like to say, oh, Islam is not just a, a faith, it's a way of life. It's the way we eat, it's the way we dress, it's the, you know, all this stuff. But Islam might feel to us then something that we can observe, something that we can wear, something that we can eat, something that we can do on a prayer mat, things like that. But Islam is not how we are. Why, and why don't we think of it as such? Because Islam is that way. How we, how we think, how we view things, how we interpret things, and how we then uh, act in the world. So just some things for us to think about, inshallah, as we uh, go into the second part of the khutbah. I say these words of mine, and I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah and the Lord of all humanity. And I ask Allah to bless and bestow peace on the Prophet So just some concluding points here for us. We're living in a country and a society where our faith represents maybe just one, maybe two, maybe a little bit less than 2% of the population. And oftentimes we may feel like we're on an island as far as our faith is concerned. And especially when we try to think about its relevance to that which we're consuming, that which we're being fed, and that which we are seeing. We, 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 we will oftentimes bring our faith into question that, hey, I'm seeing different movements. I'm seeing different uh, groups of people uh, protesting out in the streets or having different political debates. And I, I just think I want to put my faith, just uh, just put it in a nice, um, 
shiny cupboard and just keep it away um, from all of this stuff, then no, what your, your faith is actually that which you wear um, and that which you go and you, you, you take those arrows, you take those, um, those responses and you see like, how, how, how can I put my faith in the forefront of this conversation? Um, and so whether through the words of skeptics or the influences of different media or our own doubts in our mind, our Islam at this time and space, especially in a time of isolation, really feels much like a ship going through a turbulent storm. Um, and so it's, it's just kind of shaking back and forth. And we're just like in the, in the cargo bay, just trying to uh, hope it does not sink. Um, but what are we doing to kind of keep it going forward? What are we doing with the sails? What are we doing uh, if we need to anchor it at some point? Uh, we should take comfort, though. And having a faith that is not bound or restricted in its benefits and gems by a certi certain time period, that uh, we take pride in the example of our Prophet Sallallahu of the prophets that came before, and of the many Muslims who came after, who faced similar challenges to their faith by the world that's around them, by other people in there, yet they kept their faith relevant through these challenges. And the Prophet Sallallahu foundational sources of faith and inspiration were, as we mentioned, ridiculed and dismissed by his society. His closest uh, tribesmen dismissed it just wholesale, yet he continued to relate to those whom he would mention, to these prophets that preceded him by thousands of years and still bring their struggles and their resilience to the forefront. Um, this, this tells you that, and even like in terms of expression of his faith, we mentioned in a previous khutbah that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu when he had lost um, his child, Ibrahim, um, he started crying and, you know, crying, just showing that, you know, just him uh, just deconstructing the, the notion of masculinity in that culture. You know, a lot of his uh, sahaba were just looking like, you know, Prophet Sallallahu what is this? What, 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 are, what are these things coming from your eyes? Like, what, what's going on? Uh, and he said that this is rahma, this is mercy. And th this is this is what uh, this is this is faith because uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is Ar Rahman and this is Rahma this is mercy and keeping that in conversation rather than just hey my 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 kid passed away or hey I'm I'm feeling sad he's he brought his faith into conversation even at the lowest points of his own life I believe Ibrahim had uh, or Ibrahim uh, had passed away. Um, just uh, maybe the year or a few months before, six months or so before he had, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi himself had passed away. So he had already gone through the prophetic mission. Um, and he had this to say, that he kept his faith still relevant even at that moment. So as we think about it, additionally, we are um, also exposed to different activities and mediums which will start to consume our time and they distract us from our faith or we think that they do. And we need not le live in separate spaces or in uh, these multiple lives. We need not have these different spheres. Uh, we can have like, hey, this is uh, something I'll do in the workspace. This is something I do at home. That's totally fine. You have your distinctions and whatnot. But in terms of just being a different person in different spaces, um, that's where uh, your, your faith definitely gets marginalized. And Islam is all encompassing. And in these activities too, we can find Islam. And lastly, we must do what we can to keep connected to our faith as well as keep our faith connected to us. Because uh, at the end of when this is all wrapped up, when this is all done and said and done, that's the one thing that we will have that goes with us into the next life is our faith. And so uh, may Allah make this, uh, this, this life, this journey, this experience, one in which we can continue to connect to our faith and continue to work on this relationship with our faith, that it may last with us in this world as well as into the next. عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يعمر بالأدل والإحسان ويثاذ القرباء وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون يذكر الله يذكركم ودعوه يستجب لكم ولا ذكر الله يكبر O servants of Allah may Allah be merciful to you May uh, Allah commands you to act with justice, to confer benefits upon each other, and to do good to others as one does to one's kindred, uh, and forbids evil which pertains to yourself and to the evils which affect others, and prohibits, uh, prohibits any revolt against uh, lawfulness. He warns you against being unmindful. If you remember Allah, he too will remember you. Call on Allah and Allah will make a response to your call. And verily, divine remembrance is the highest virtue. We ask Allah to be a nasir for us, to help us, to keep our faith at the forefront of uh, all matters, that we may never cease to for return to it for replenishment. We ask Allah to be a sabur, a shafi, al-wakil, al-hakam, for patience, for healing, for witness, 
for justice for those who were wrongfully killed in recent mass shootings and their families of Atlanta and of Boulder and of countless others due to gun violence. We ask Allah to be Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, bestowing upon us mercy, yet caring for us and nurturing us as we traverse through the womb of this life to our hopeful rebirth in the hereafter. We ask Allah to be Al-Afu, for forgiveness and pardoning for any of our shortcomings before this day. We ask Allah to be al-wadud, to engender a love for Islam in our hearts and a love that encompasses us like the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses the creation. And we ask Allah to be as-salam and al-adl for peace and justice to prevail for all those who have been wronged, victimized and murdered by uh, the injustice, the, the unjust uh, ones around uh, around the earth. And we ask Allah uh, to be ar rauf to comfort the oppressed of this world and to enable us to be their comforters. Lastly, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be ar rafir to alleviate all those who might be suffering from the effects of this pandemic, physically, mentally, economically, and to help us be the facilitators of this alleviation. And we ask Allah to uh, allow these experiences, these setbacks, these wounds, these different things that we're consuming, all our new mediums and changes that we've been experiencing during this time to be sources of healing, sources of growth and sources of benefit for the world around us and for ourselves and that we may leave this Jummah better than we enter, uh, entered it. Rabbana la tuzik kulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahab Rabbana la tuakhidna in nasina aw akhtaqna Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala alladhina min qablina Rabbana wa la tuhammilna ma la taqata lana bi wa'fu anna wa gfir lana wa rahamna anta maulana fansurna ala al-kawm al-kafirin Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahima wa ala Ali Ibrahima innaka hamidu majid Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahima wa ala Ali Ibrahima innaka hamidu majid uh, brothers and sisters, Jazakallah Khair for coming to our Jummah khutbah. And inshallah, uh, we will see each other um, sooner than our next khutbah. But may Allah keep you and may Allah bless you. And I hope you have a great weekend, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Usama. Jazakallah for a, another home run khutbah. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. And, and Fauzia can also attest that she's here with me. We're packing up Ramadan in a box. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll move on to announcements. We'll start off with that. Uh, we've got something new this year. Uh, it's called Ramadan in a Box, and it's a box of mm -hmm. things to sort of get you uh, get you prepped for Ramadan. Oh, I can't turn them. Oh, I don't know if I have the I have the virtual background. Um, you do. Yeah, so uh, you can go to the website, go to our swag shop, and you can see what what is all inside. Um, don't forget every Thursday from six to eight, our chaplain office hours. You can register and um, stop by check in with Usama, check in with other community members, um, a great way just to keep um, community and connection throughout the week. Tonight at 6.30, we have a virtual book club. We will be discussing the book, Secrets of Divine Love. Uh, go to the website, find the link to join. Tomorrow night, we will be doing another session of the prophetic biography. As we've gotten a little behind, we wanna make sure that we wrap up our discussion series before Ramadan starts. So that'll be tomorrow night at 6.30. And then following that, we have virtual game night. Uh, we are coming back with categories, which was a real blast when we did that back in December. So uh, fun for kids and adults. I know it's a little late. It's 830. But even if your kiddos can stop in for a round or two, they will enjoy it. Don't forget, uh, we do have a new program starting in May, inshallah, called The Functioning Muslim. It's um, going to be a great discussion series uh, focused on a variety of topics that are specifically um, uh catered to young adults. So ages about 18 to 24, you want to go to the website, go to the email, find the link, sign up. Uh, inshallah, that's going to be great. Lastly, got to remind you guys, community survey, you guys have done a fantastic job submitting responses. Uh, and we have learned so much about you. So never too late. Come back, tell us more about yourself, spread the word. The more feedback we get, the better, inshallah, Muslim space will become. That is all I have for you all. I hope you guys all have a great Friday, and I will open it up for a little chit-chat.